Chapter 1. Cultural Rehabilitation. The Many Benefits of Fermented Foods. Fermented foods and drinks are quite literally alive with flavor and nutrition. Their flavors tend to be strong and pronounced. Think of stinky aged cheeses, tangy sauerkraut, rich earthy miso, smooth sublime wines. Though not everyone loves every flavor of fermentation, humans have always appreciated the unique compelling flavors resulting from the transformative power of microscopic bacteria and fungi. One great practical benefit of fermentation is that it can preserve food. Fermentation organisms produce alcohol, lactic acid, and acetic acid, all biopreservatives that retain nutrients while preventing spoilage and the growth of pathogenic organisms. Vegetables, fruits, milk, fish, and meat are highly perishable, and our ancestors used whatever techniques they could discover to store foods from periods of plenty for later consumption. From the tropics to the Arctic, fermentation has been used to preserve food resources. Captain James Cook, the 18th century English explorer who extended the far reaches of the British Empire, was recognized by the Royal Society for conquering scurvy, vitamin C deficiency, among his crews by sailing with large quantities of sauerkraut. Among the many lands Cook discovered, in quotes, and delivered into the crown's realm were the Hawaiian Islands, where Cook later lost his life. I find it interesting that the Polynesian people who crossed the Pacific Ocean and populated Hawaii more than 1,000 years before Captain Cook, also sustained themselves through the long voyage with fermented foods, in this case poi, a thick starchy taro root porridge still popular in Hawaii and throughout the South Pacific. Fermentation doesn't only preserve nutrients, but generally breaks them down into more easily accessible forms. Soybeans are a good example. This extraordinarily protein-rich food is largely, largely indigestible, and some would say toxic, without fermentation. Fermentation breaks down the soybean's dense, complex protein into readily digestible amino acids and simultaneously breaks down the potential toxins, giving us traditional fermented soy foods such as soy sauce, miso, and tempeh. Milk, too, is difficult for many people to digest. Lactic acid bacteria transform lactose, the milk sugar that so many humans cannot tolerate, into easier to digest lactic acid. Likewise, gluten that has undergone bacterial fermentation as opposed to the pure yeast fermentation most commonly used in contemporary breads is broken down and easier to digest than unfermented gluten. According to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, which actively promotes fermentation as a critical source of nutrients worldwide, fermentation improves the bioavailability of minerals present in food. Bill Mollison, author of the Permaculture Book of Ferment and Human Nutrition, calls the action of fermenting foods a form of pre-digestion. This pre-digestion action of fermentation also breaks down certain toxic compounds found in foods in benign forms, as mentioned in the case of soybeans. Another vivid illustration of this is cassava, also known as yucca, yucca, or manioc, the tuber native to the tropical Americas that has also become a staple in equatorial Africa and Asia. Cassava, grown in certain soils, contains high levels of cyanide and is poisonous without removal of the toxin. One common method of doing this is a simple soaking fermentation. Peel and coarsely chop the tubers and submerge them in water for about five days, which breaks down the cyanide and renders the cassava safe and nutritious. Not all food toxins are as dramatic as cyanide. Grains and legumes contain a compound called phytic acid, which binds with zinc, calcium, iron, magnesium, and other minerals, blocking their absorption and potentially leading to mineral deficiencies. 
Fermenting grains by soaking them before cooking breaks down phytic acid, rendering the grain far more nutritious. Nitrites, prussic acid, oxalic acid, nitrosamines, and glucosides are other potentially toxic compounds found in food that can be reduced or eliminated by fermentation. Fermentation also creates new nutrients. As they go through their life cycles, microbial cultures create B vitamins, including folic acid, riboflavin, niacin, thiamine, and biotin. Ferments have often been credited with creating vitamin B12, otherwise absent from plant source foods. However, some argue that what had been identified as B12 in fermented soy and vegetables are actually inactive analogs known as pseudovitamin B12. Some ferments have been shown to function as antioxidants, scavenging cancer precursors known as free radicals from the cells of your body. Lactic acid bacteria create omega-3 fatty acids, essential for cell membrane and immune system function. The fermentation of vegetables produces isothiocyanates and indole-3-carbonyl, both regarded as anti-carcinogenic. A marker of cultured whole food supplements boasts that the culturing process generates copious amounts of naturally occurring ingredients like superoxide dismutase, GTF chromium, detoxifying compounds like glutathione, phospholipids, digestive enzymes, and beta-1,3 glucans. Frankly, nutritional factoids like this make my eyes glaze over. You don't really need molecular analysis to tell what you, that your foods are healthy. Trust your instincts, your taste buds, and how it makes you feel. The data adds up to this. Fermentation makes food more nutritious. Perhaps the most profound benefit of eating fermented foods is the bacteria themselves, which are probiotic, meaning they can be beneficial to us. Many different fermented foods are embodiments of dense and biodiverse microbial communities which interact with our microbiome in ways we are just beginning to recognize. This interaction can improve digestion, immune function, mental health, and many other aspects of our well-being. Not all fermented foods, however, are still alive when you eat them. Certain foods by their nature cannot contain live cultures. Breads, for instance, must be baked, thereby killing the organisms present in them. However, many fermented foods can be consumed live, and alive is the most nutritious way to eat them. Read labels and be aware. Many commercially available fermented foods are pasteurized or otherwise heat-treated, which extends shelf life but kills microorganisms. Ferments that are still alive generally include in the label words to the effect that they contain live cultures. If you want live culture fermented foods in our world of prepackaged mass-produced food commodities, you have to seek them out or make them yourself. By promoting digestive health, live fermented foods can help control digestive disease processes such as diarrhea and dysentery. Live culture foods have been shown to improve infant, infant survival rates. A study conducted in Tanzania compared mortality rates between infants fed different weaning gruels, some fermented, some not. The infants eating fermented gruels had half as many diarrhea episodes as the infants fed non-fermented gruels. Lactic acid fermentation inhibits the growth of diarrhea-related bacteria. Another study reported in the journal Nutrition concludes that thriving microbiota prevent disease because lactic acid bacteria competes with potential pathogens for receptor sites at the mucosal cell surfaces of the intestines and proposes a treatment strategy of eco-immunonutrition. As 18 letter words go, I like the word eco-immunonutrition. It recognizes that an organism's immune function occurs in the context of an ecology an ecosystem of different microbial cultures, and that it is possible to build and develop that cultural ecology in oneself through diet. 
eating bacteria-rich foods is one way to do this. Eating lots of plant fibers or prebiotics is another. A huge body of research reaffirms the fact that bacteria play an important role in protecting us as organisms among organisms from disease. The case for microbial coexistence. Western culture is terrified of germs and obsessed with hygiene. We live in the midst of the war on bacteria and our bodies are major battlegrounds. We are taught to fear exposure to all forms of microscopic life. Every new sensationalized killer microbe gives us more reason to defend ourselves with vigilance. Nothing illustrates this more vividly than antibacterial soap. A few decades ago, mass marketing of soap with antibacterial chemicals was but a glimmer in some pharmaceutical executives' eyes. It has quickly become the standard hand-washing hygiene product. Are fewer people getting sick as a result? No data support the efficacy or necessity of antimicrobial agents in such products, and a growing number of studies suggest increasing acquired bacteria resistance to them, warns the American Medical Association Council on Scientific Affairs. It is prudent to avoid the use of antimicrobial agents in consumer products. The antibacterial compounds in these soaps, most commonly triclosan, kill the more susceptible bacteria, but not the hardier ones. These resistant microbes may include bacteria that were unable to gain a foothold previously and are now able to thrive thanks to the destruction of competing microbes. According to Dr. Stuart Levy, director of the Tufts University Center for Adaption Genetics and Drug Resistance. Hygiene is important. Wash your hands often with soap and water, hot if possible. But we don't need more than chemi- we don't need more and more chemicals to make us safe. Antibacterial soap is just another exploitative and potentially dangerous product being sold by preying on people's fears. In our bodies, microorganisms we are host to vastly outnumber our bodily cells. They are present in mind-boggling numbers, comprising elaborate communities that vary according to each ecological niche, inhabiting our skin with its diverse moisture conditions, all our, all our orifices, in greatest concentration throughout our intestinal tracts, and increasingly we are finding them in places where previously they were presumed not to be such as the womb. These organisms provide us with an incredible array of services. Bacteria enable us to effectively digest our food and assimilate its nutrients. They synthesize essential nutrients so that we do not need to obtain them via food. It has become clear that serotonin and other chemicals that influence how we think and feel are regulated by gut bacteria. Our immune function is largely the work of bacteria, and bacteria that we come into contact with stimulate immunity. A growing number of researchers are finding evidence to support what is known as the hygiene hypothesis, which attributes the dramatic rise in prevalence of asthma and other allergies to lack of exposure to diverse microorganisms. The more germ-free we try to be, the more vulnerable we become. Well-informed hygiene is very important, but it is impossible to avoid exposure to microbes. They are everywhere. Much of Western chemical medicine aims to eradicate pathogenic organisms. In the case of my AHIV drugs, the treatment strategy is called highly active antiretroviral therapy. Having benefited from the miracles of high-tech pharmaceuticals, I'm in no position to argue against the value of this approach. I firmly believe, however, that microbial warfare is not a sustainable practice and that the war on bacteria is not a war we will win. Bacteria are not the germs, but the germinators, the fabric, all of life on earth, writes Stephen Herod Buhner um, in Lost Language of Plants. In declaring war on them, we've declared war on the underlying living structure of the planet, on all life forms we can see, on ourselves. Health and homeostasis require that humans coexist with microorganisms. 
bacteria counting scientists have quantified this simple fact, estimating that each person's body is host to a bacterial population in excess of 100 trillion and noting that the interconnections of these colonizing microbes with the host are nothing if not complex. Humans and all other forms of life evolved from and with these organisms, and we cannot live without them. Nature appears to maximize mutual cooperation and mutual coordination of goals, writes ethnobotanist Terence McKenna. To be dispensable to the organisms with which one shares an environment, that is the strategy that ensures successful breeding and continued survival. Like my Terence McKenna voice? I don't know what he sounds like. Bacterial cells are prokaryotes without nuclei. Their genetic material is free-floating in the cells. Genes from the fluid medium, from other bacteria, from viruses, or from elsewhere enter bacterial cells on their own, writes biologists Lynn Margulis and Carlene Schwartz. By incorporating DNA from their environment into themselves, prokaryotes assimilate genetic traits. They are thought to have evolved first into structured cells with nuclear membranes and eventually into complex organisms such as ourselves. But they never left their progeny. They are with us as always. Prokaryotes are the master engineers of our complexity, explains my excited scientist friend Joel Kimmins, a PhD nutritionist. Inside our bodies, most dramatically in the gut, bacteria absorb genetic information that informs our function as organisms. They are an integral part of our sentient experience. We eat and thus we know, says Joel. Humans are in mutually, mutually beneficial and mutually dependent relationships with these and many different microbes. We are symbiotic, inextricable, inextricably woven together in a complex pattern far beyond our capacity to comprehend completely. Microbiodiversity and incorporating the wild. Ooh, let's see. By eating a variety of live fermented foods, you promote microbial diversity in your body. The live bacteria in those ferments not heated after fermentation enters our bodies where some of them survive the stomach and find themselves in our already densely populated intestines. There, they help to digest food and assimilate nutrients as well as stimulate immune responses. There is no one particular strain that is uniquely beneficial, rather the greatest benefit of eating bacteria lies in biodiversity. Few, if any, of the bacteria we eat take up residence in our intestines, but even so, they have elaborate interactions with the bacteria that are there and with our bodily cells in ways that we are just beginning to recognize and that remain little understood. Biodiversity is increasingly recognized as critical to the survival of larger scale ecosystems. Earth and all of its inhabitants compromise single seamless matrix of life, interconnected and interdependent. The frightening repercussions of species extinctions starkly illustrate the impact of the loss of biodiversity and all over our planet. The survival of our species depends on biodiversity. Biodiversity is just as important at the micro level. Call it microbiodiversity. Your body is an ecosystem that can function most effectively when populated by diverse microorganisms. Sure. You can buy probiotic supplements containing specific strains, but by eating traditional fermented foods and beverages, especially those you ferment by yourself with wild microorganisms present in your environment, you become more interconnected with the life forces of the world around you. Your environment literally becomes you. As you invite the microbial populations you share the earth with to enter your diet and your intestinal ecology. Wild fermentation is a way of incorporating the wild into your body, becoming one with the natural world. Wild foods, microbial cultures included, possess a great unmediated life force 
which can help us lower our susceptibility to disease and adapt to shifting conditions. These microorganisms are everywhere and the technique for fermenting with them are simple and flexible. Are live fermented foods the answer to a long healthy life? The folklores of many different cultures associate longevity with foods such as yogurt and miso. Many researchers have found evidence to support this causal connection. Pioneering Russian immunologist and Nobel laureate Elie Michnikov studied yogurt-eating centenarians in the Balkans early in the 20th century and concluded that lactic acid bacteria postpone and ameliorate old age. Personally, I'm not so inclined to reduce the secret of lifelong and good health to any single food or practice. Life consists of multiple variables and every life is unique. But very clearly, fermentation has contributed to the well-being of humanity as a whole. The methods of fermentation are many and varied. It is practiced on every continent in thousands of different ways and... As you proceed these pages, you will see how simple it is for you to share in the nutritional and healing powers of fermented foods and drinks that humans have enjoyed for thousands of years.